Hey everyone, Shane Cunningham here. Uh, so if you watched our last video, we did the bear skinny video and the one before that a couple years ago, a few years ago, was the bear field dressing video. So today we're going to do a uh, butchering, home butchering video on this. This one's a bear. I got this two nights ago. It's been in a uh, commercial style cooler for the last uh, couple nights. The, the big thing with bear hunting, if you're going to get into bear hunting, is have a plan for when you get a bear. Uh, with, with bear, time is of the essence so once that bear is down and you go to make the recovery the quicker you can get that out of the woods uh, guided or field dressed scun and in a cooler below six degrees celsius or lower the better because bear does not it'll turn really quick and that's what a lot of people don't they try to hang it in their backyard when it's really warm out or they'll leave the hide on it overnight with all that fat and we trimmed a lot of this off and we scun, scun it up the other night all that fat and then the hair, it just insulates that meat so much that it won't cool off properly. So even, I mean, we just picked this up from the uh, cooler probably an hour and a half or so ago, and that fat already was, it was hard when it came out of the cooler, that fat's starting to get soft again now. So even that quickly, it'll it'll warm that, warm that up again. So this one here, I have some commercial meat cutting equipment, but as we go through this, I can explain what I'd do if I didn't have a meat saw, if I was just doing it by hand. So the first thing is, I've got the whole bear, and this is the way we do them up. Uh, like say, if you had a really big bear trying to carry this in, maybe you're going to want to break it down into two or three pieces. This was a smaller bear, so it's not, a, not that hard to handle. So a lot of times, too, as I'm going through any hairs that came off uh, while we were skinning it, and that's what happens with wild game, they get on there, I just pick them off because I don't want those in my roasts or my chops or steaks or anything else as I'm going along. So this one, this part is pretty basic for breaking it down. Basic hand meat saw. My first cut, usually I'm going to come right in ahead of where that hip bone goes. So I'm going to come in through just to break those legs, the hams off from the, from the uh, backbone. And I could do this on the commercial meat saw, but anyway, that just separates those legs this piece here where you have the ribs and the loins so same idea I'm going to come right in behind that front shoulder and again I could do this on the on the bandsaw but as quick as it takes to break it down or if you didn't have a, a bandsaw And now all that bloodshot stuff I'm going to cut it. That's where the arrow entrance was here. Exit I just cut right straight through with. That was the exit right off the side. Oh, no, sorry, the exit's back here. So, the double long shot. So, I'm going to cut all that bloodshot stuff out of there as I go. To keep that out because I don't want any of that or any of the hair in the meat. Away. So, breaking it down. If, if I didn't have a meat saw, I'm going to want to split this down, whereas a meat saw I can do it so much quicker. But I could do that with a hand saw, break that down. Another way, there's a lot of hair on there. We could bone this out completely. So off these front shoulders, you can get all these big muscles out. You can still cut those into roasts or chops if you wanted. A lot of this stuff off these front legs, they're just going to go in for trim and stuff for, for a burger. We're going to grind that all up. So I'm going to bone those all out. If you want a soup bones, you could easily chunk those up into soup bones. But we'll bone it out and make that into burger. Or your midsection, you see your loin. Here's your tender loins here. You see a lot of people will cut those out right away. I like leaving them on the chops. Gives you that little special treat along with the strip loin muscle. That's either side of that spine. So with the bandsaw, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to split right straight down the middle. And then I'm going to make these into chops because I like bear chops. If you wanted to, you could strip those tender loins out. You could cut these down the outside and then strip that strip loin out of there for boneless chops or stew meat or, or small roast, whatever you want to do. Uh, the ribs, we're just going to strip those into ribs the same as you would pork spare ribs. So those will get stripped down. Like I say, I'll trim around all that stuff where the arrow went through, cut that blood shot out. So, so that loin will come out of that. And then for my hams, same idea. I'm going to split it right down through the, through the backbone there with the spine. It gives me two different hams. I can cut right in behind. This is your H bone, your pelvic bone. So right behind that H bone, I can take take that off and make a rough roast off each side of that. And then I could make these into steaks if I wanted. 
I prefer roast myself, so I'm going to probably roast these up. I'll cut them up into bigger roasts. When I get down near those tougher ends, then I'm going to bone that all out and uh, make that into burger. So I've broken this down using the uh, meat bandsaw. Like I say, uh, if you don't have it, then this could all still be done by hand, just slower is all. So this took me all of probably four or five minutes anyway. So anyway, I've got my loin set aside here. Like I said, the tenderloin's still on there. I'm going to trim this all up and get that fat and everything off of that before I cut them. And then I'm just going to cut those into chops all the way down because I, I do like bear chops. If you didn't, like I say, you can strip this tenderloin off. It's got a little bit of bloodshot here, but that loin muscle runs right between this rib and down that backbone. So you could cut that loin out and be your strip loin on the, on the beef. But that's your loin, you can cut that out and you can either make them into boneless chops if, if you didn't have a saw or if you prefer them that way, I prefer bone in. Uh, of course, ribs stacked up here. I got a lot of trim to do on them because we got a lot of bloodshot in there from the damage from the arrow. Even though it, uh, it was a nice pass through the ribs, it still sent a lot of bloodshot through uh, through it and behind those ribs, so I'll get all that out. You wouldn't want to eat any of that, so that'll be trimmed out and go in the scrap bucket. Uh, my hind legs, I got my two rump rows sitting back in here. Same idea, I'm going to uh, trim a lot of the fat off of them. I leave a little bit on. Some people like it all off. I don't mind a little bit of bare fat, and it gives a good flavor. I leave a little bit on when I'm cooking it, and then I'll uh, trim that off after I cook it. And a lot of it will go to liquid anyway. And then I just took my hams and cut those right down, same as I would for pork, for, for round roast. So I like them as uh, both that size roast. I'll do those in the slow cooker, same idea. I'll trim a lot of that fat off. I'll give them a scrape, get that bone dust off. And we'll, uh, we'll do those up as a roast as well. Uh, the shoulder roast, I've got my two butt end shoulders, so I'll keep those. My picnic ends, I have those sitting here. And that's a lot of bloodshot, so that's going to wind up either being a small roast. If it gets down too small, once I start cutting all that blood shot, Stuff out of there. If it's too small, I'll just turn that into burger. This stuff's all for trim that's going into burger. I'm going to bone that all over. There's a lot of big bones in here off the legs and stuff, the ends. So there's not as much meat there as what it looks like right now by the time I bone it all out. But I'll get the majority of the fat out of it and any of the sinew and stuff. We'll show that after and get all the bones out of it before I run through the grinder. And then my two, two halves of the neck, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to bone that all out. I have taken these for roast before. They make great roast. So. I may change my mind and put those into roast yet, so they, they, they'll they literally fall apart in the slow cooker whenever I cook them that way. So Anyway, well, I'm going to get those cut up into chops and we'll get those set aside and then we'll start picking away on this pile. What's that that you're removing? So that's just the spinal cord. Uh, it doesn't really do much to leave it in. I have left it in. If it's too mushy, I will leave it. A lot of times if I can get it out. Sometimes it can give a little bit of an off flavor. Not a, not a huge deal, but if you split the spine down anyway and then you expose that spinal cord, you just, sometimes if you can get it out, then we'll get that out. That's what a bare spinal cord looks like. Trim fat off, and then I'm going to chuck these loins in the freezer and let them set up a little bit. Because, like I say, even and there's that bloodshot stuff, like I say, I just get that right out of there. So, that can be good to eat. So, and that will give you off flavors. So, usually when I'm cutting that out, I'll just cut down until I get into good meat. If I have to, then I'll have to cut that whole piece out. But that one's just a little bit in the end of the loin. So, but if I trim the fat before I cut it into chops, then there's less trimming to do once it goes into chops. I'll have to trim each individual chop then. So what I'll do, I'll sit these in the freezer and just let them set up a little bit. They'll start to chill. They won't freeze, but they'll set up a little better. It just makes it a little easier on the side to pull together better. So just trimming up these ribs. 
So you can cut them smaller if you wanted to and make them into little short ribs. Usually that size is good and then if somebody wants to split them they can just use the cleaver too. So I get all the fat and sinew off of that. There was a big batch of bloodshot on this so I trim that all off, get that down in. Move a little piece there. This one is really bloodshot so I'm going to cut right down through it and you can see there's nothing really useful on that at all. You can spend a little bit of time get a little tiny bit of that, but I might, uh, looks of that, I'm just going to chuck it because it's uh, been in there quite a bit. So, looks like I know there's another rib too here. You can see the blood shot. Okay, that wouldn't be good tasting at all if you tried to eat that. So, usually with a rifle, you're going to lose more meat, especially if they're hitting the shoulder. So. This one here, I get down past the ends of the ribs. I'm just going to chuck that aside and I'll go through it after for what I can get out of it for, for burger. Get closer to me. So, same idea. Get a lot of that fat off. And as this bear starts to warm up, the fat's getting more and more slippery. So, I find with bear a lot of times I got to keep stopping to wash my hand because I try to keep my knife hand out of the fat, but it you know, obviously doesn't work. You see the shine on them there. So. That trimmed off. A little bit of blood shot there. There we go. Ribs are good to wrap up like that. And then we'll just keep trimming away on these ones. So. Alright, so I'm just trimming up a few roasts here. I got that one all trimmed up pretty well. Like I said, I don't mind leaving a little bit of fat on. I'll take that off after I cook it. This is just personal preference. Some people like it all off. I like a little bit. So that's just a small roast there. Set that aside. All I'm using here is just a bone scraper. It's just, you can see, you see close enough here, you can see the bone dust comes off the meat saw. So that bone dust sometimes can turn and give a give a flavor to the meat. So all the scraper does is just scrapes that bone dust off. A lot of times I'll pinch the meat together to force that meat up to get all of it. It doesn't have to come off, but it, it can, like I say, turn the, turn the meat a little bit. And then I'll just, all I do to clean that off, I'll just clack it on the side of the bucket. Usually goes everywhere. <laughs> and like I say, I'll trim a little bit of fat off and leave a little bit on. And any hair and stuff too, I want it there. I want to be picking bear hairs out of my mouth when I'm eating. So just to show everybody, uh, this is uh, what we use for wrapping the meat. Uh, we use the waxed uh, butcher wrap. It's available at a lot of food supply place stores, and, uh, and we would buy it on a roll. So uh, it's stuff they've been using for well over 100 years, and uh, it still works well today. It, uh, we find it doesn't stick to the meat, and the meat doesn't get uh, frostbit as well. If it lasts long, it's, uh, it's quite durable. If you have any bone edges or anything, it's not poking through a lot. So. Just like wrapping a Christmas gift, she tucks all those corners in, make sure there's no exposed areas. Piece of freezer tape to hold it closed. We keep it pretty, uh, pretty basic, just bare roast. Doesn't matter what cut it is to us. So for ourselves, we just put that on and, and the date. So just so we know when we open the freezer up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the roast from this year. Alright, so just boning up these neck pieces, you can see I got the trim bucket over here. So I don't want very much fat in there. Like I say, bear, bear has a lot of fat through it. A little trick I'll do a lot of times when I'm putting it in, I just give that a squeeze and make sure you'll feel there's a piece of bone in there because it does happen and you don't want the run running through that through the grinder. So anyway, I always keep the trim bowl around. So there's this next piece, neck neck piece I have here. I'm just taking my knife edge and I'm falling along that spine and just peeling the meat back. I don't want to cut into the bone you know, with all my knife all up. But it doesn't have to be perfect. I can come back and pick that over after if I need to. But basically you feel that's just bone there, right? So 
and then sometimes you, if you cut the edge of the bone you will have a little neck piece so. uh, I like little strips like that they go through the grinder better I'm gonna say a lot of times I'll chill those out too before I put them through the grinder just to make them sit up a little better a little bit of fat's not gonna matter too much I don't want any big gobs of fat or anything and like that I might trim that out little strips like that piece just makes it easier going through the grinder. I don't put uh, anything in, leave anything in the roast or run it through the grinder, anything I wouldn't eat myself. So any of the stuff goes in the scrap bucket. If it's bloodshot, big gobs of fat, hair, anything like that, I don't want to eat it, so I'm not putting it through anything through that. I do the same if I was cutting anybody else's animal the same way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wrap up something that I wouldn't eat myself, so. So just boning out these uh, lag ends here, so as I pull the leg muscles off, you can really see it on this one here. See that sinewy looking tendon, just the end of the, like the, the tendon or ligament. I don't even want that going to the grinder because it not only can bind the grinder up a lot, but even that, it doesn't grind up very well. So if it doesn't bind it up, it does manage to get through. It's not something you're gonna wanna be chewing on when you're eating the, the burger meat and stuff, even if it did make it through. So a lot of times I'll just separate that down. Not to be too picky, but in those little pieces, just the seconds it takes there just to cut those out the same thing i'm just going to cut either side of that sinew and that's the advantage of doing the home butchering you can take a little bit more of your time and pick through things a little bit more when you're doing it yourself got all the chops done up here uh, I usually do them in packs of four it all depends on your family size really but uh, I find if I have people over or more of my family want to eat some that I can take two or three packs out but I find four chops just the right amount for bear and then uh, I've got the trim for the burger I threw it in the freezer the deep freeze for now and I'm going to grind that up a little bit in the meantime while Sally's finishing wrapping up these chops clean the meat saw and the block all down and everything and get that stuff cleaned up it's going to be done one time or the other so I might as well pick away at it while we can keep up, and then I'll do the burger next, and uh, I'll show you how that's done. And, uh, let me wrap that up. All right, so we get everything else done, just the burger left to do. So it's, like I said, this is what we call trim. Don't have a whole lot. Uh, I always like doing a double grind. You know, I have done triple grind sometimes in the past, but I find double grind good. Uh, you can see the size. I just ran a little bit, thicker, so you can see the size of the uh, the plate that I have in this grinder. Uh, this is a, a Hobart commercial style grinder. Uh, some of the Cabela's uh, uh, commercial grade grinders they have now, the Carnivore series, they're a really good grinder. If I was looking to replace, that's exactly what I'd get. Uh, this one does a great job, but it's big and heavy and hard to move around. But, uh, anyway, if you're doing any home butchering, a uh, grinder is one of the key things you need. You can get away with a saw, do a lot of it, uh, you know, trimming out by knife and stuff and hand cutting, but you really should have uh, a grinder for if you want any kind of ground meat at all so but uh, anyway uh, just to go over two before we finish off uh, say with this this we're usually doing one pound package just same idea if we if we want to take out more we have more people over cooking a bigger meal we'll take out more packages of it uh, just to go over the yield though on a bear uh, we find with bear a lot of times from you take if you take a live weight bear say it weighs 200 pounds just to keep it even a 200 pound live weight bear that means just the whole bear hide guts everything in it 200 pounds you get about a 50 percent yield out of that of carcass so for the 200 pound bear you're going to wind up with a 100 pound carcass by the time you take the head the blood the guts everything else out of it and the hide and all that off it you wind up with say about 100 pounds now that 100 pounds usually you can see the, the scrap bucket we have here there's probably about 20 pounds of just you know bloodshot meat extra fat that we didn't get off before uh just, just bone, some of the bones that I boned out stuff to make the burger and stuff. So you're not looking at, somebody thinks you get a 200 pound bear and they go, oh, that guy's got 200 pounds of meat. 
it's not going to be. You're going to wind up with, you know, 60 pounds of meat out of that. So roughly, maybe, maybe a little better. But uh, And then out of that, of course, a lot of that we left bone in. So either you're going to cook it up, but of course you're not eating bones. So, But anyway, we're going to do this burger up and then uh, we'll probably make a bunch of it into uh, donair meat, which we had another video showing how to make uh, bear burger donair that uh, Travis and I put together last night. So uh, Tonight we're just going to grind this up and uh, we'll wrap it up. We may make a little bit of uh, bear donair out of our own and the rest we'll put in the burger. And we use bear burger the same as we would beef burger. Our family cooks it for, you know, tacos, spaghettis. Uh, sometimes we'll do hamburgers with it, whatever. But uh, we use it the same way. Some people add a little bit of pork fat in it for flavor or for fat content. I find bear is fairly good. I like lean meat anyway. It, uh, it comes out just fine the way it is for me. I don't know. I like the taste of it. So anyway, thanks for watching and... Uh, We'll uh, catch you next time.